marathon. Finishing one of these is considered the holy grail of distance running achievements to some. To others, it's a distance they look forward to competing a couple times a year, trying their best to dig into new personal boundaries. To the fearless elite, however, it's their sole purpose in life to complete this distance as fast as humanly possible. The methodical nature of the 26.2 mile or 42.195 kilometer race has made it nearly impossible to perfect, which is why it's had one of the more erratic and interesting developments of any endurance race out there. From the way these athletes run to specific courses, to advanced and refined footwear, there's a lot to cover about this grueling event outside of just pure fitness alone. Before we get to those parts though, let's go way back to the old days when competitive running just started picking up, and to also talk about the world record progression of the marathon. Before the standard of 42.195 kilometers that we now know existed, the marathon race back then was a little shorter and not as strictly defined. The closest thing that existed was the Olympic standard of 25 miles in the late 1800s, but even if we use that metric, there were plenty of publications decades before this of people running this exact distance without even knowing it would become a standard at any point in time. As early as 1809, you had someone completing 25 miles in four and a half hours, and by 1826, someone was documented to have completed the quarter century journey as fast as two hours and 36 minutes. There were methods of accurately measuring distances long before these times, but it's a little tricky to verify these records given the lack of detail and the likeliness of a lack of verifiability too. The first reliable time that was faster than this we can give a bit more credit to is George Dunning's 23344 back in 1881. The big kicker here was that the Brit had broken the unofficial record from distances 21 miles and up, which inadvertently gave us some nice splits to look at to give the record a lot more legitimacy, and seems to have some corroboration as well. It wouldn't be all the way until the new century though, where another Brit by the name of Len Hurst would finally be the one to dethrone this three decade old record by running 233.42 on August 27th, 1903. Half a decade later, the traditional standard of 26.2 miles would come into fruition, thanks to an interesting debacle regarding the 1908 London Olympics course, but records didn't quite start becoming ratified under the standard until years down the line. If they were to, however, we'd be starting off with, well, the 1908 Olympics, where Johnny Hayes ran 255.18 to claim the gold medal. Dorando Pietri technically had finished faster despite a catastrophic shutdown his body went through, as he finished the last 400 meters in 10 minutes. Since he was technically assisted by race staff near the end to propel his body up and to get him through the line, he would be promptly disqualified following a protest from the American Olympic team. Hayes' mark was met with one improvement after the other given the event's records had essentially reset itself. But it should be worth noting that just about every marathon back then was done on a point-to-point -point course, where the start and finishes of the races were on entirely separate ends. The reason why this can be so advantageous for world records is because it allows courses to have a net decline, and if the race has a tailwind that day, it could subtract a significant amount of time on top of that. By 1990, rules would be set in place to disqualify world records under these conditions, but for now they'll simply be annotated or briefly explained for transparency's sake. The first record that would surpass Hurst's 25 mile mark in terms of raw skill, in other words if we were to convert his time to a full marathon, would be Italy's Umberto Blasi, who ran 238 on the dot on November 29th, 1914. This mark would last for over six years, but when it did get surpassed, it was blown out of the water by a Finnish athlete, Hannes Kolihamainen, who ran 232.35 at the 1920 Olympics. While former records had 10 mile or 15 mile splits, this appears to be the first one with its first documented half marathon split. Given Kolehemainen came through at 1.12.10, it seemed like athletes were taking a much more aggressive approach and would just deal with the fatigue in the latter stages. Despite the record free-falling with each new athlete that set it, massive gaps in times would still see prevalence with each new record that arrived. On March 21st, 1935, a race in Japan would take the marathon rankings by storm that year, as while Suzuki Bochu broke the world record running 227.49, it would actually be Song Kijong to not only win the race, but was the first ever man from Asia to wear the marathon record crown, running a time of 226.14.
it should be worth noting that there seems to be some conflicting recounts of what actually happened here, as the IAAF ratified the former instead of Song ki -jong's time. And different dates appear to be mentioned on Wikipedia despite them supposedly racing at the same event according to the ARRS. Regardless, these two times were phenomenal for this era, but once the 50s rolled around, the British would come back with not just another brilliant marathoning star, but arguably the most influential marathoner of the 20th century. And his name was Jim Peters. Jim Peters was a solid runner from the United Kingdom in the 1940s, but his introduction to the international scene may not have been as glamorous as he would have hoped for. While he had made the 10,000 meter final for the 1948 Olympics, he wouldn't end up placing very well, and was even lapped by Czechoslovakia's Emil Zatopek. This left a frustrated Peters thinking about dropping the sport altogether, with seemingly no hope for global glory. But after getting his spirits lifted back up from his coach, Jimmy Johnson, he would suggest the marathon as the potential key to his career. At the 1951 Polytechnic Marathon in London, his debut was a wildly successful one, upsetting the favorite Jack Holden and setting the new British record of 229.24. Next year, Peters returned to the Poly Marathon with a wildly different goal in mind. This was very evident given his first 10 miles were done in 51.35, which for reference is 2.15.15 pace. With such a brutally aggressive start, Peters' tempo would ultimately suffer at the hands of his aerobic engine struggling to churn further, but he would finish the race with a massive new world record and a near 9-minute personal best of 2.20.42 on June 14, 1952. A month later, he would try to compete in the Olympics marathon, but unfortunately wasn't able to finish. Peters seemed to have found his limits in some fashion given he faltered trying to run two marathons so close to each other, but perhaps spreading them out a bit would not only allow him to compete more freshly, but to break the world record on both occasions. As in 1953, he set the new world record yet again at the Poly Marathon in June, and then in October at the Turco Marathon. He continued this streak by breaking the record once more for a fourth time at the Poly Marathon, running 2.17.39 on June 26, 1954, cementing him as the king of the event at this point. However, a heroic tale can come with some of its harshest downfalls, because Peters would stumble figuratively, and even literally, into his most catastrophic performance yet. Competing at his first Commonwealth Games, Jim Peters had a stressful reputation to maintain. Not just the fact that he was winning just about every marathon he entered, but many were likely expecting a fifth world record out of him too. Unsurprisingly, Peters would go out guns blazing despite the sweltering 80 degree temps beaming on him as he would find himself with Stan Cox around 9 miles in, only to drop him shortly after, coming through a reported time of around 55 minutes at 16 and a half kilometers in. Despite not being on record pace, Peters continued to push thinking his rival would be gaining ground on him, but in all reality his lead was actually comically large. Unfortunately, he would not be able to make it to the stadium on record pace, but once he did get there, this was what would ultimately happen. And late that same afternoon, a stricken Englishman entered the gates of Empire Stadium to write an agonizing chapter into the history of international game. Dazed and dehydrated, he collapsed just 220 yards short of his goal inside Empire Stadium with the nearest competitor miles behind him. The misunderstanding over the finishing line, and Jim Peters staggers into the arms of team masseur Mick Mays, beaten for strength, but not for courage. Covering half a lap on the track in well over 10 minutes, Peters was eventually escorted across what physiotherapist Mickey Mays thought was the finish line and had completely lost control of his body by this point. Medical reports state that Peters wasn't exactly all there, with bouts of hyperventilation, profuse sweating, and more. Throughout his time at the Shaughnessy Hospital, he would continue to regain consciousness and asserted that had he been wearing a cap that day to block out the sun, he would have won the race and stated that he would likely return to race once more, perhaps with some more T's crossed which could produce another potential world record. Sadly, in his build-up to the 1956 Olympics, Peters appeared to have lost his spark with running entirely, but was quite confident that he could have run anywhere from 212 to 215 if he were to adhere to a regimen of running three times a day. This was the official ending of the Peters era. Overall though, Jim Peters will go down as one of the most influential marathon runners of the 20th century, 
his willingness to treat the event as a brutal test of time trial supremacy, as opposed to a more calculated, campy competition race, was highly, highly admired by fans of his. Especially when you see just how he would train leading up to races. With Peters out of the 42 kilometer pool, it was time for a new generation to appear, and perhaps a chance for new countries to shine to represent their mastery in the event as well. Despite Peters' one-of-a-kind streak of records, unofficial or not, the marathon in general was still steadily improving to the point where a record was likely going to arrive within the next few years. By 1956, four men would break the 220 barrier at the Finnish championships, but Pavo Kotila, the winner, would set the new official world record, running 218.04. Now, even if we were to count Peters' record of 217.39 as the time to surpass, even this would be annihilated at the European Championships, because Soviet Union Sergei Popov had a monster performance at this event, running 215.17 on August 24th, 1958. In the last few decades, we've seen records set at various national championships, but when were we going to see something like that happen at the Olympics again? Well, in 1960, a trio of countries that had never received a medal in this event since its inception would all be a part of a glorious showdown, with a caveat that still remains to be an incredibly unique one to this day. The individual 5k splits are allegedly a bit all over the place and likely not accurate, but by the 20k mark, Ethiopia's Abebe Bakila and Morocco's Radhi Ben Abdesalami were through in 102.39, nearly identical to Popov's world record pace. By 30k, the two were teetering on the tightrope of history. As the sunlight dimmed, Bakila would unleash a critical blow to the Moroccan, striding away in dramatic fashion through the sights of Rome, and set the new world record by less than a second, running 215.16.2. You may have noticed something different about a baby Bakila compared to every other runner during the competition. Not the fact that he won and everyone else didn't, but well, he appears to be missing some crucial footwear. To this day, this is the fastest barefoot marathon ever performed, and Bakila's performance was also a massive inspiration and benchmark set for future Ethiopian runners to strive to emulate or surpass in the future. The introduction of the 1960s showed that there was another layer of the marathon that needed to be peeled off. During Bakila's record-breaking year, 12 separate men had gone under 220, and while 1962 was a near replica quality-wise, nothing popped up that would be quite newsworthy just yet. On February 17th, 1963, a relatively unknown marathon event from Japan would spawn an unprecedented amount of high-quality times. 10 Japanese runners would go under 220, and 5 of them were under 216. The one to beat the record, though, would be Tarasewa Toruru, snubbing Bakila's barefoot greatness by 4 tenths of a second, running 215.15.8. What's interesting about this time was that the first 20 kilometers were actually quite conservative, meaning that Tarasawa negative split the race by a notable amount, a strategy that was not very common back then for breaking records. Leonard Edelin from the US would then lower it, running 214.28, but given this happened at the Polytechnic Marathon, the ARRS didn't count it. Instead, they ratified UK's Brian Kilby's 214.43 that also occurred that year. Needless to say, the 60s were starting off pretty hot. While the record wasn't tumbling down towards every minute barrier possible, the event was clearly garnering the international talent that made it impossible for an athlete to take the record more than once. At the 1964 Olympics, though, that was about to change. Gila takes the lead just before the halfway mark, and he's never headed all the way home. Four years ago, as he crosses the finish, still running effortlessly. He has enough energy left to simmer down with calisthenics. In his second Olympic appearance in a row, Bakila had managed to break the world record, but this time in a much, much more convincing fashion. He had also since converted to conventional footwear, which seemed to have unlocked a new level of potential within the Ethiopian, and utilized a very aggressive pacing method to get him there too, coming through the first 20k in just shy of 61 minutes. Coincidentally enough, the same exact geographical storyline would show up once again. As the last time Bikila's record was broken, it was taken back by a Japanese runner. On June 12th, 1965, Shigematsu Morio would run 212 on the dot to represent the nation once again, but since it was at the Polytechnic course, it again didn't quite count. 
but was still recognized at the time. Like before, let's say for fun though, we do count this mark. It would only really last for a few years anyways, and would be overshadowed by a mark so amazing that it didn't just surpass another minute barrier for the event, but something even more groundbreaking. Derek Clayton had broken the 210 barrier for the first time ever in the marathon, running 209.36 on December 3rd, 1967. You might be wondering for a time this prolific why exactly I didn't mention his progression up until this point, or how the race unfolded. To put it short, no one had a clue who this guy was. The only results that seemed to exist were a 222 from 1965, as in 1966 he was injured. That means on his second marathon ever, he ran a 13-minute personal best and annihilated Bikila and Morio's marks. Two years later, Clayton had lowered it by another minute in 1969, but according to the ARRS, the course was sadly found to be short. With the 210 barrier smashed into bits, naturally the next question was, can someone run under two hours? It took three decades to go from 230 to under 220, but from under 220 to under 210, it only took less than 20 years. Throughout the 70s and in 1980, four separate people broke the world record, but it remained stagnant in the 209 range. By 1981 though, the Fukuoka Marathon would make a major appearance once again, where three separate men broke 210. The man to come out on top though, would be an Australian by the name of Robert De Costella, running 208.18 on December 6th that year. Alberto Salzer from the US had run a few seconds faster at the New York Marathon, but the course was found to be 150 meters short. De Costello would continue to tower over the rest in the following years for the marathon, running the fastest time in 1982 and 1983, and grabbing a world championship title along the way. In 1984, De Costello would place just outside of a medal position at the Los Angeles Olympics, but figured he'd give the event another stab while he was in the US and that event was the Chicago Marathon. Chicago's course was pretty new being introduced in 1977, and it didn't bring in much international talent until 1983. Athletes would prove the course was pretty quick, and when you look at the elevation chart, you could see record potential was there. The Olympics being in America in 1984 would guarantee a much denser field this time around, as Di Costella, Portugal's Carlos Lopes, and other heavy hitters from the Olympics were present. Footage is scarce, but we do have some documentation of how the earlier parts of the race unfolded. At 10 miles, multiple athletes record a blistering split of 48-48. For Di Costella, this was mostly expected, but for Great Britain Steve Jones, he was so surprised that he even seemed to question the accuracy of the time, and whether or not him or the other competitors were truly running at sub-208 pace. The pack of elites would continue to press on at world record pace, but as they approached mile 18, an ambitious Jones would try to pull away, with only Gabriel Kamau from Kenya latching on. Kamau ultimately couldn't handle the pace, and as Jones would continue to evade the hungry Olympians right behind, he would not only be wildly successful in doing so, but would set the new world record in his marathon debut. I don't know how close he is to the finish line or Jeannie and Don, but he's only, if he's going to break the world record right now, he's got those got legs. He's got to lift those knees. He's I think he's got it. He's got it. He's got the world he's record. He's got a chance he's to do it. He's going to do it. He's going to do a world record. Steve Jones, Barry Wales, a new world oh, really? record. He's a fantastic finish. Steve Jones, 20806. Oh, Seven seconds. Please. And look at him. He is unbelievable. ecstatic. He is ecstatic. Steve Jones, unbelievable. Steve Jones's jaw-dropping performance made him an overnight sensation. A man who had pulled out of this very race last year from a tragic ankle injury that he couldn't bear about halfway through, but would get the sweetest revenge possible, taking down an Olympic and world champion, and of course making a profound statement for his proper full marathon debut. This undoubtedly proved the Chicago Marathon to be very quick, but little did people know that a select few runners were eyeing up a course in the Netherlands that may or may not have had the same amount of potential. And just a few months later, after Jones's historical race, the Olympic champion Lopes from Portugal would truly put it to the test with a pretty swift statement of his own. 
Portugal's ageless wonder, Olympic gold medalist Carlos Lopes, 38 years young, broke the world record. He clocked in at 2 hours, 7 minutes, 11 seconds. Needless to say, the concept of fast yet legal marathon courses had started to take form. Chicago was fast, Rotterdam was also fast, Fukuoka also had a pretty fast course, but Rotterdam was starting to prove to be the most ergogenic course yet. As Ethiopia's Belene Densimo smashed the 207 barrier in 1988, becoming the first Ethiopian man since a baby Bakila to snag the marathon record crown. Despite the marathon entering a revolutionary era of fast and flat courses, there would be a slight drought with not a single athlete going under 208 all the way until 1994. And even then, these two were performed at Boston, which, again, doesn't count for records. In 1995, a pair of runners would discover yet another fast course. And this was in Germany, the Berlin Marathon. This event was like it was designed to be quick. But like Chicago, it wasn't quite bringing in the talent to take full advantage of it just yet. However, Belgium's Vincent Russo and Kenya's Sammy Lele had sent an indirect message to the rest of the professional scene with their low 207 times, letting others know if a record was to be done that they had another option. Just a couple years later, someone would adhere to this advice, but the man who did so would be yet another unlikely candidate as he would have the race of his life and would set a number of historical marks while doing so. Running a three-minute personal best and on his second marathon ever, Ronaldo da Costa from Brazil had proved himself worthy of becoming the country's first ever world record holder in the event. It was also the first ever marathon that averaged under three minutes per kilometer the entire way and would also break the two-hour barrier at the 40k mark. In essence, breaking two hours was just a little over two kilometers away, or in other words, 14 seconds per mile. Now, this is a massive amount of time and distance to be covered still, and in no way are these stats meant to undermine such a daunting task, but we're about to approach a new millennium. Because as we'll see soon, even the biggest skeptics would start to see glimmers of hope towards the forbidden 159. Just before the 2000s rolled around though, an intense race at the Chicago Marathon was brewing up a potential world record. The car shown here puts the runners at almost exactly the Costa's record pace, and at the halfway point we're through at a similar tempo in 106.07. About 85 minutes in, it's Kenya's Moses Tanui who finally takes charge, and begins to press even harder to prevent the slightest chance of the chase pack from catching him. The broadcast highlights with about 5 miles to go, he's on pace to break 206, except this entire time, Morocco's Khalid Hanouchi had been slowly making up the massive deficit Tanui put on him the entire time, mitigating what seemed to be an impossible gap to now just being 10 or so seconds away. Tanui's turnover appears slightly slower as the minutes click by, with Hanouchi's cadence quickly allowing him to not just catch up to Tanui, but immediately blows past him to take the lead on his own. With two miles to go, Hanuchi is now the one to be still maintaining that sub-206 pace. And with a smooth stride towards the finish, it's the Moroccan who will lower the record by yet another minute barrier. Just a few years before Hanucci's 205 time, he would become the first athlete since Derek Clayton to perform back-to-back -back records, and more interestingly, did so at the London Marathon out of all places. 
This would also seem to mark the end of an era where other venues had a chance to become world record contender courses, because as the Berlin Marathon grew more and more popular, and as the golden age of distance runners started to emerge, it quickly became unanimous where the place to set a new world record would be. And there were two countries who would fight tooth and nail to hold it, and they weren't gonna let anyone else into the mix. While countries like Kenya and Ethiopia had become established countries for distance running record holding as far back as the 60s and 70s, they had yet to make as much of a dominant presence in the marathon. Kenya in particular had yet to establish a single record in the event, but that was about to change at the 2003 Berlin Marathon. Previously mentioned Kenya's Paul Tergat and Sammy Career were initially on pace to run a low 206, but after 25k, this transitioned into a fierce feud as the duo refused to let each other get even the slightest advantage, picking things up quickly step by step. These two were not concerned about time with just a few kilometers left though, because these marathons have fairly sizable prize pools nowadays for the winner. In this battle for the title and money though, the winner would not just get a hefty check in the mail, but would go home to their country as the breaker of yet another marathon barrier. Paul Tergott's transition to the marathon in 2001 have proved to be incredibly effective setting yet another world record in another lengthy discipline, becoming the first man to go under 205, and was the first Kenyan in history to set a new world record in this event. It was also right around this time frame, however, another former track legend had been making his way towards the event, and that was Ethiopia's Haile Geber Selassie. In 2005, he ran 206.19 in Amsterdam for the fastest time that year, and in 2006 joined the exclusive club of 205 runners doing so in Berlin. Returning back to the Germany course once again, Gebre Selassie was decimating the rest of the field, and even though his halfway split was just barely sub-205, the tactical master himself would perform the most calculated and beautifully executed second half, breaking the record not only just this year, but had even put himself in position to do it yet again. Bon. Yeah, indeed, but uh, Bialka, Jan Bialka of Poland uh, is the pacemaker for... He looks very comfortable himself. Well, I was going to say, Stuart, I believe they've now passed through 30 kilometers. In fact, they passed through 30 kilometers. And that's Gebre Selassie going through 40 kilometers, 157. 34 from Gebre Selassie at 40k and he's now on a, well probably about two hours four minute pace. Gebre Selassie writes yet another chapter in the most astonishing distance running career in history. Two hours four minutes and uh, three minutes and 57 seconds unofficially there. Haile Gebre Selassie has done it once again. He wins Berlin. His third consecutive win in Berlin, his second consecutive world record on the streets of the German capital. It is Haile Gebre Selassie, all smiles, full of energy once again. With a 2.03 time on the board, and three times in a row a world record was set on this course, the Berlin Marathon had proved its efficacy as the potential home of any record-chasing endeavors. Rotterdam was also another potential candidate given it produced three of the fastest times in 2009 and 2010, but even when some of the best arrived to the line, the perfect storm wouldn't fall into place there. 2011 was easily one of the stranger years to be a marathon fan, because at first you'd be screaming in your chair that two men miraculously demolished the world record, almost breaking into the 202s, except that it was in Boston. A course we've established by now that is not course legal, and there was a reported notable tailwind aiding the athletes for a healthy portion of the race. At the age of 38, Gebre Selassie returned to Berlin and ran with the Pacers from the gun. 
At halfway, a 101-43 is registered, with four others forming a healthy group alongside. Over the next 15 minutes, the pace is respectively pushed given the predicted finishing time had dropped, and the fact that the field is quickly diluted to just two runners, Gebra Selassie and Kenya's Patrick Macau. At 27k, Gebra Selassie starts to drastically fall off the pace and begins walking shortly after, clenching his bib, and is struggling to maintain his balance. Miraculously, he gets his footing and is attempting to obtain some sort of second wind, but the man of the hour, or rather two hours, currently belongs to Macau. At 35k, Macau is over 30 seconds ahead of Gebra Selassie's previous world record pace, and even though he slows down a little over the last few kilometers, he would prove Kenya's brilliance in the event once again and would proudly bring the title back to his home country. Últimos metros é o novo recorde mundial. Ele vem agora para a linha de chegada. Ele chegou a sair um pouquinho do percurso. 2 horas 3 e 38. É o novo recorde mundial de maratonas. Ele quebra o recorde mundial que era de Raine Gebreselassie. E mais uma vez o recorde mundial caindo na maratona. Now, it might seem like a coincidence that the Berlin Marathon has created not just one, two, or three but four world records in a row. But the thing was, it showed no signs of stopping here. In 2012, the top time that year was in Berlin, and in 2013, Wilson Kipsang from Kenya would keep the Berlin seat hot with his first world record in the event, running 203.23. To make matters even more absurd, fans were somehow blessed with yet another promising attempt in 2014, as five men clocked a 101.45 first half, which is technically behind record pace, but We've been seeing quite a few faster second halves happen in a race before. The following kilometers would show a slight change in pace, but once the sub 250Ks began to click off one after another, it became no surprise that only two men remained, which was Dennis Cometo and Emmanuel Mutai. I mean, just look at this chart. There's no way at least one of them doesn't snag the new world record, right? Drei Minuten, ein Stück Sportgeschichte eingerissen von Dennis Kimetto, 2-0-2. Dennis Kimetto geschenkt bekommen von einem Freund und er ist der neue Weltrekordhalter und er kann es noch nicht realisieren. 2-0-2-57. Mutai's 2-0-3-13 also would have been the world record, but Kimetto had now entered a new echelon that truly started to spark the million dollar question. Is the Sub-2 Marathon actually doable now? Sure, there's been many people speculating that it could happen and that it would take years and years down the line, but what if no one wanted to wait that much longer? What if we found a course even faster than the Berlin Marathon? What if we assembled the perfect field and pacers? And what if we devised footwear so perfect that it could take entire minutes off of an athlete's time alone? This is Breaking 2. On December 12, 2016, Nike would introduce one of their most ambitious running projects yet, Breaking 2. Here was the plan. Recruit some of the best marathoners in the world, keep them on a perfect training regimen, and keep track of every physiological factor to tweak everything to perfection. Put them on the perfect course in perfect conditions, and lastly, provide them the most optimal footwear that will optimize their running economy. In other words, the amount of energy it takes to run at a certain speed. With the current world record still at just under 203, this meant that they were going to have to cut off a significant amount of time, about 2.5% to be exact. This also meant that due to the extremely precise and tailored factors required to set up this event in the first place, if a record were to happen, it was very, very likely not going to be ratified under the current World Athletics guidelines. Furthermore, there were a few people that were a little skeptic about Nike's ambitions towards innovation in shoe technology in particular, especially since that same year at the Berlin Marathon, Kenyan Elliot Kipchoge's insoles came flying out of one of his shoes early on in the race, but still ran a fantastic time in the end and still gave immense credit to the overall performance metrics of the shoes. Showtime was set to occur sometime in 2017, and here were your three athletes set to attempt at. 
First up was Lalisa Decisa. The young Ethiopian pivoted to the marathon as early as 23 years old and found insane success despite being paired against some athletes who had a decade's worth of experience over him. For his debut, he won the Dubai Marathon in 204.45, won the Boston Marathon a few months later, and placed second at the World Championships in Russia. While his performances in 2015 and 2016 weren't stellar, the team still saw tremendous potential in him. Next, we have Zerzane Tedese. The era train is widely considered as one of the greatest half-marathoners, if not the greatest half-marathoner to ever exist, as he's the current world record holder in the event. While his marathon time is mediocre at best compared to his contemporaries, the team at Nike thinks if they gravitate to Desi towards a more volume-heavy running style, along other things, that the sub-2 pace could be a walk in the park for him. Lastly, we have Elliot Kipchoge. The humble Kenyan possesses one of the smoothest and elegant forms the sport has seen in years. Known as the teenager who upset legends like Isham El Garouj and Kenanisa Bekele in 2003, his longevity in the sport has transferred beautifully in the marathon, winning all but one race up until this point, is the reigning Olympic champion, and currently has a personal best just behind the world record at 2.03.05. As far as the build-up to Breaking 2's official debut goes, Decisa seemed to have some trouble running at world record pace. During the 1200 meter repetitions they did on the track, his lactate turn point, or in other words, the point at which his legs will start to become much harder to move quickly, was frankly a bit off of world record pace. If your legs are producing too much lactate at a given speed, then you simply won't be able to sustain said speed for an extended period of time. On Tedese's side, he seemed to be showing much less restraint in his tests, and the team actually made a major discovery that might explain why he dropped out of marathons so often. It turns out, Tedese did not consume fluids during any of his half marathon or marathon races. In a half marathon, he was able to get away with it, but this could very likely explain why he was dropping out so frequently in the marathon and why his full marathon mark was so lackluster compared to his half marathon one. For instance, a 58.23 in the half marathon equates to at least a 204.32 on the World Athletic Scoring Tables. Now, Kipchoge, on the other hand, was by every metric just about perfect in the eyes of the team. He was receptive, cooperative, and was likely the most fit out of the trio, displaying no anomalies within his training that needed any drastic changes. The three would ultimately band together at the test course hosted in Italy, and would see if they could handle world record pace for at least half of the race. Here's exactly how the test went. Go. Kipchoge would finish smoothly in 59.19 with a quick smile. Tedese would also finish below goal pace as well in 59.42, but appeared fairly drained afterwards. Decisa sadly was in rough shape from the get-go, and would finish behind his marathon personal best pace, running a disappointing 102.56. Seeing the setup for this race was quite fascinating too. The diamond-like formation of the pacers was meant to eliminate any wind resistance, they also rotated pacers in and out, and the sheer amount of pacers they had was damn near impressive. Anyways, the results weren't perfect across all athletes, at least when we factor in how they felt afterwards, but there were some proposals for these two. The solution for Decisa was to up the speed of his workouts to handle the pace in general, and the solution for Tedese was to increase the volume of his training so he could capitalize off of his half marathon speed further. Time constraints would likely limit such a change in training though, because ready or not, they were going to have to be at that Italian Formula 1 track by May 2017. The half marathon test did show some potential, but now the full marathon was either going to confirm the team's data, or perhaps the brutal nature of the marathon would take its natural toll it's historically had on anyone who tries to disrespect it.
again, and now he just he just seems to be having trouble holding on. Obviously, he's not getting the benefit of the Pacers at this point. Okay, he's just a, a second over the desired pace, still projected to run the two-hour marathon, which is incredible, as Ed says. in good preparation and good planning. If you turn that, then uh, in 20, 25 seconds, we'll go. Okay. Two flat 25, just 26 seconds away from what would likely be on the Mount Rushmore of athletic achievements. Decisa had gassed out early on and Dedese had started to drop off just before the halfway point. But Kipchoge had sub two within his grasp for around 35 kilometers until the deficit was too much to make back up in the final stages. This race, though, was still a groundbreaking discovery for many reasons. One, they found an athlete who is capable of doing it. Two, they found an athlete who believed they can do it. And three, the technological advancements and calculations of pacing, shoes, weather, really everything under the sun, had shown that literal minutes could be taken off if you put it all together. That same year, Kipchoge had capitalized off of his newfound success and attempted to break the official record in Berlin, only to come a bit shy running 203.32. However, once he gave himself another year to fully recoup and to have a much more conventional marathon season, he would set a mark that completely blew the event beyond what anyone could have ever thought could be done in an official setting. And that, as you can see, puts him 52 seconds ahead of average world record tempo, the world record 205, 202, 57, split average pace for the world record, 156.32. How neat is that at 40K, exactly a minute ahead. Absolutely outstanding. And at last, the world record is his. How fitting is this? The Olympic champion is the world record holder, 201.40, unofficially there, brilliant Kipchoge. Remain his best for the rest of his life. It may well remain the world record for many years to come. Elliot Kipchoge had broken the world record for the largest jump in time seen in over half a century. To pull something like this off in such a developed stage of the sport was just otherworldly to see. Some were quick to credit this drastic time drop to the advent of Nike's now called Super Shoes, and while there is some validity to these claims, it still didn't take away that Kipchoge was completely and utterly unstoppable in this event, and that he was destined to take the record down even further. After running 202.37 to win the 2019 London Marathon, news would break that Kipchoge was approached by a London-based chemical company, Ineos, and by May that year would announce that another sub-two-hour marathon attempt would take place that same year. Were they going to do things differently than Nike, though? And if so, what were they? Let's start off with location. The race will be held in Vienna, Austria, same time zone as breaking too, so no need for Kipchoge to worry about altering his sleep schedule or dealing with jet lag. Next, the climate. The race was set to happen on October 12th, 2019, with about a week window added in case of non-optimal conditions. Meaning a nice high 40 degrees Fahrenheit start with a low 50s by the end should be perfect, especially if there was little to no humidity. The course was pretty much perfect too, being held at a park with no sharp turns and virtually no changes in elevation, and the nice downhill start at the beginning would give the athletes and pacers an easy entry into the right rhythm. This leads us into the pacing. Instead of a diamond shape like Nike did, Ineos opted for a V formation, with two pacers behind him, for a total of seven pacers, which will interchange with 34 other runners. As a nice touch, the pacing car this time around would have much more visible lasers shooting out mitigating even the slightest deviations in pace to ensure a pristine tempo from front to back. The shoes were changed up a bit as well, 
As Kipchoge would still be using a shoe with a high energy return, they were tweaked a bit in all sorts of ways to optimize his already great running economy. And lastly, the audience. Last year's attempt was barren, as no one outside of the staff and invited guests were allowed near the course. But this time, just about anyone was welcomed. In short, this event appeared to be tailored a bit more to Kipchoge's liking. His training was likely perfect up until this point too, given his flawless streak of marathons thus far, so the only thing left to do was to just let the race date roll around, and to let the science, body, mind, and soul do the rest. The current weather, well, almost perfect, a little bit more humid at 90% than was expected and was wanted, but... Uh, Ellie... We have liftoff. Apollo Kipchoge is up and away. As we're off for a second shot at history, the temperatures are perfect. The wind is minimal, but a bit of humidity does thicken the air just a bit. Regardless, Kipchoge was in the best shape of his life, but the splits would be telling the real story here. The first 5k is a smidge quick at 14.10, but even 10k in, the synchronized group of athletes bring him through the 10k at exactly the same pace. The 15 and 20k marks display a slight slowdown to revert back to the original target tempo, and while we seem to not have an exact half marathon split, it's certainly below the hour mark. And at 25k we get a bit more confirmation that the sub 2 train is still a moving. As intense as it would have made it for there to be some drastic pace deviations, maybe Kipchoge messed up his hydration at one point, but no. This was just athletic, technological, and logistical perfection just occurring for minutes upon minutes. Struggle was just not a word that existed during this attempt, and as the crowd of Vienna rallied on while Kipchoge parted the sea of pacemakers that helped in these last 40 kilometers, the world would get to witness a giant step, or rather ten thousands of steps, towards athletic perfection. 20 seconds, Elliot Kipchoge! Whoa! On his shoulder, 140! <laughs> 140 of the unofficial oh, line. Just... Edmund Hillary, we can now add the name of Elliot Kipchoge. Shalane, sum it up for us. To tell people that uh, no human is limited, you can do it. I'm expecting more of the athletes in this all over the world to run under two hours after, after, after today. Elliot Kipchoge had put on an endurance masterclass for one hour, 59 minutes, and 40 seconds. The INEOS team's efforts combined with Kipchoge's immense belief to make it all happen was thankfully the perfect combination to set forth a landmark for human achievement. Many have since drawn comparisons of this mark to the sub-4 mile, but I don't think that's a remotely fair one to make at all. The sub-4 mile was a sure inevitability given two Swedish runners had run 401 well before Bannister, and that's accounting for World War II preventing multiple countries from competing in the first place, but the sub 2 hour mark was something that was genuinely considered near impossible even with the current existing technology, talent pool, and training methodologies. If anything, this is more comparable to Eddie Hall's 500 kilogram deadlift, a lift so jarringly powerful that it took a complete overhaul of the psyche to access the muscle fibers to even pull it, and only one other man has done so to this day, with the rest frankly not even being close. Kipchoge's record, of course, isn't ratifiable under the current guidelines, but who said he wouldn't eventually return to really put his stamp on it to silence any and all doubters? Du fast lächeln. Und dann sagt er, hey Leute, und hier kommt die nächste Zwischenzeit. Ja. Oh. Hei, 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 hei. Es ist Weltrekord, es wird die neue Bestzeit. Er klopft sich auf die Brust und hat es geschafft. Zwei Mark Kurier, der Landsmann von Ele Kipchoge, der sich auf die zweite Position... Kipchoge's 20109 seemed like it would be the last official world record we'd see in a while. Kenanisa Bekele had dropped a 20141 out of nowhere in Berlin back in 2019, but outside of that, even breaking 203 was a monster personal best for just about any other athlete, and as Kipchoge got older, this rendered the possibility of any further records less and less likely. The gold, or rather diamond era of marathon record setting, had seemed like it was going to enter a drought sometime soon. The best marathoners outside of Kipchoge at this point were running well, frankly nowhere near as fast, and the spark just didn't seem to be there. But wait a minute, wh where did this guy come from? 
Washington is the winner of the 2022 Trinidad Alfonso Valencia Marathon. Wow. The third fastest time of all time, the fastest debut of all time, and he's still only 23. This is Kelvin Kipton. He'd been in the scene for a little while now, but was mainly known as a decently fast half marathon guy who could place in the top 10 at most events. In 2022 though, Kipton would give the full marathon a whirl instead of the half in Valencia, and his aerobic engine seemed to be molded perfectly for this distance, running the third ever 201 time and the fastest marathon debut by far. Everyone was pretty shocked and confused because, I mean, who was this guy? He was only in his early 20s during Valencia, so where in the world could he go from here given Kipchoge was setting similar times being a decade older? At the 2023 London Marathon, fans of the event paid close attention to the wildcard as he came through with the leaders in 101.40 at the half. With no real strategical data on how Kipton would tackle this second half, some may have expected something quick, but perhaps not this quick. So we might not just have a course record on our hands here. We may be on for something really, really special. So again, finish line, 201, 26 or so. That is the second fastest marathon time ever. Ethiopian, but today was all about Kelvin Kipton. Dominance, rewriting that all time record list and putting himself all the way up there. While Kipton didn't steal the record crown from Kipchoge, this was a mark that had a statistical anomaly within it. We know the second half of this race had to be fast, but to run under an hour in either of the halves of the marathon was outright unheard of, and doing it in the second half was even more absurd. This immediately tickled the minds of those who flocked towards a sub-2 happening in an official race, or at the very least, a sub-201. People felt like it was just inevitable at this point, especially given his uniquely powerful speed in the back half. Thankfully, Kipton would be racing again this year, but would not be heading to Berlin, actually, but instead ran in Chicago, a course we haven't seen a record on since 1999, but the women's world record had been shattered there in 2019. Not even 20 minutes in the race, there are only two people with the lead pacer, which are Kiptum and one of his training partners, Daniel Mateko. 2842 marks a respectably fast 10k opener for the duo, but the two come through the half in just a little shy of 61 minutes. But this was considerably faster than Kiptum's London Marathon pace. Impressively, Mateko fearlessly continues to stay with Kiptum up until this point, and the two are still rocking by 30k. Like London though, Kiptum is just able to transform into an entirely other being, and drops Mateko to the point where he quickly breaks down entirely, and would just end up dropping out. At 40k, Kiptum's predicted time had dropped by an entire minute somehow, and is now in contention to run his first ever sub-201 time. Surely enough, the Prodigious Canyon delivers yet another groundbreaking time, and will now claim the throne to kickstart his own legacy. He's waving to the crowd, kisses. An amazing effort by Kelvin Kiptum for a new world record at the Bank of America Chicago Marathon. Because Chicago will always remember you for this. Congratulations on this wonderful world record. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you. Back to you guys. Two hours, 35 seconds, essentially proved at this point that it was doable. The marathon scene finally received its shooting star that they had been waiting for, and it frankly looked like he was just getting started. There were even publications that his coach said he was running upwards of 300 kilometers per week, which means his training was probably a high-risk, high-reward approach, as opposed to the more conventional 80-20 training splits we're used to seeing pros do nowadays. By December 2023, Kipton was scheduled to race in the 2024 Rotterdam Marathon, a Dutch course we've established by now is quite fast, and was the potential target to break the two-hour barrier. The 2024 Olympics now had a complete change in predictions for who would win, which made things quite interesting given Kipchoge was the likely favorite a year or two prior. Regardless, let's see how his first genuine attempt at breaking two hours would go, and if he would take a more aggressive approach this time around, or would try to run another insane second half like he's always been known for doing, to shatter the once-dot-impossible barrier at an official marathon.
The men's marathon world record holder, Kelvin Kiptum, has been killed in a car accident. The Kenyan athlete died along with his coach. When Early reports from Kenyan media say Kiptum and his coach died in a car accident Sunday. On the passing of Kelvin Kiptum, the latest world record holder in the marathon, and of course the news came in last night. This was a man that had so much promise, yet his life has been just cut uh, so uh, suddenly. Kenya's president, William Ruto, was among thousands of mourners saying farewell to marathon world record holder Kelvin Kiptum on Friday. On February 11th, 2024, approximately 11 p.m., Kelvin Kiptum was reported to have died in a car crash with his coach. The police suspected that Kiptum lost control of his vehicle at one point, which ultimately sent him off the road towards a tree, causing a myriad of injuries to his skull, ribs, and lungs. This news was just unbelievable in every facet possible. Initially, some had brushed off the initial reports as either fabricated or misreported, but no, this was the reality the running community, and more importantly, his loved ones would have to come with face to face now. Articles would start pouring out regarding a group of mystery men who showed up to Kiptum's residence, but as far as I'm concerned, nothing has come out of this and is still currently a part of an ongoing investigation. The woman who survived the crash has since given a statement to police, but again, nothing further has been delivered publicly. Arguably the greatest running talent since Usain Bolt had disappeared from the limelight just as quickly as he had entered it, and the running and really the sports world in general has since offered their greatest condolences to commemorate and celebrate his electrifying presence he was able to offer while he was here. The marathon world record has proved to have one of the most unique developments out of any distance running event by far. No one even knew just how long to make the event to begin with in the 1900s, and here we are today with the unique rise of super shoes, the continual development and introduction of new talent, and as of now, the quest for an official sub two hour time. A goal unfortunately halted in its tracks with the tragic passing of Kelvin Kiptum. Each marathon record tells its own running folktale due to the naturally long nature of the event, and their contributions to bravely trying to tackle such a feat will always be remembered. As of 2023, we have only seen one athlete run under 202 that wasn't Kiptum, Kipchoge, or Bekele. And outside of this, we have yet to see a shred of hope that someone could break two hours at a conventional venue. Kipchoge's Ineos 159 was the proof that it could happen physiologically speaking, and Kiptum was proof that the potential was there for it to happen on a real course. So now we need to see if the right man will rise to the occasion to take down the endgame barrier of the marathon and to put the hypotheticals to rest once and for all. Until then though, this has been the world record progression of the marathon, and thanks for watching. Thank you to all of my patrons for supporting the channel, and if you want to support the channel for more content like this, come on over and become a patron. Drop a sub and check out my other links below. I'll see you on whatever video I upload next and take care.